Dr Michael Cooper is a senior anaesthetist at the Children's Hospital in Westmead and St George Hospital, Sydney. He is also adjunct professor of anaesthesiology at the School of Medicine and Health Sciences, University of Papua New Guinea, and makes regular trips to Papua New Guinea. He has been actively involved in the World Federation of Societies of Anaesthesiologists and is currently chair of the Paediatric Committee. Michael, thanks so much for coming down from Sydney today. It's really kind of you. Welcome to the college. Thank you very much, Chris. This is a great honour and I feel very humbled by this and it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Let's start with a little bit about your early anaesthetic training, which was at St Vincent's Hospital in Sydney. Yes, I was a medical student there at New South and then uh, at St Vincent's and uh, resident there and then was fortunate enough to get onto the anaesthetic training scheme. Uh, Brian Dwyer, a former Dean of the Faculty, was the boss at the time and one of my early mentors and a great role model. And it was a wonderful place to train and, and I look back on that uh, very fondly and, and very grateful for the, uh, the time and the training that we were given at that time. So after your exam you became a fellow in paediatrics, what attracted you to paediatric anaesthesia? We'd all rotated to the, the Royal Alexandra Hospital for Children at Camperdown or Camperdown Children's as it's known in Sydney and uh, we did six month terms there as was the norm and uh, enjoyed it so much and uh, that was where I met one of my second mentors, John Overton, uh, who is a well known character in Australian anaesthesia and, and still a good friend to this day. And uh, he said, uh, look, would you like a, a job as a fellow? And I said, let it be great. And uh, it, was a, it was a great experience and a wonderful department, again, with a lot of really good people who, who you aspired to be like. Where did you go overseas? I went to Boston when I got to the Children's Hospital at Camperdown. Realised that the analgesia for a lot of children after major surgery could be better. And, and there was a real groundswell of movement occurring at the time and uh, discussions with John Overton and the deputy of the department was John Keneally. And John Keneally had a great interest in paediatric pain management. And so the plan was to slowly develop a paediatric pain unit at Camperdown. So I decided to go overseas uh, uh, to do some time and ended up going to Harvard, uh, to the Boston Children's Hospital and spent six months there working. And uh, that was a great time. They had set up the first paediatric pain unit in the world in Boston in 1985. And I went there in 1990. And the guys there, Chuck Birdie and Neville Sethner, were fantastic mentors and role models. We learned a whole lot of new techniques. And then it was come back home and, and try and implement some of those things so that they worked in Australia and for our conditions in our community. So we're talking acute pain? Uh, mostly acute pain. Uh, that was our initial interest. One of the things that influenced me was there was a, a paper came out in pain in 1983 saying that children having major surgery were getting much less analgesia mm -hmm. than, than adults. And there was this fear of opioids in children and, and knowledge of, about opioid kinetics was just starting to come through and all of these fears were really ungrounded and it, it, there was a slow movement of taking the bull by the horns and realising you can treat these children properly and give them good pain relief after surgery. That then expanded into other areas of paediatric pain uh, like procedural pain because there are a lot of procedures being done in children without general anaesthesia and often without analgesia like lumbar punctures, bone marrows, burns dressings and, uh, and then chronic pain and cancer pain was another big area. And once we'd started developing the unit, uh, referrals came in and, uh, you know, we got all sorts of things of treating children with mucositis after bone marrow transplant, um, even palliative care, uh, analgesic challenges. And uh, it was a busy time. There was no uh, funding allocated for this. This is on top of your normal duties. Mm. And uh, we would often be in early, check the problem patients, run out at lunchtime, go at the end of the day and have another look. And it was slowly implementing a lot of the techniques like epidurals and patient controlled analgesia um, that were sort of already coming in in adults safely into paediatric practice and having the right sort of parameters so that it worked. 
And this was happening in a lot of the major centres around Australia at the same time. So I think better medication, better ways of delivering the medication, better monitoring, and surgery has changed enormously as well. That's certainly true. All right, now to totally change the subject, in 2001, you made your first trip to Papua New Guinea, and that seems to have been the start of a new career path for you. Can you tell us about that? Yes, yes I, I always like a new challenge, and there's been a few <laughs> over the years. Um, it wasn't actually my first trip. I, I first went to PNG as a medical student uh, for a final year elective in 1981, and, and actually gave my first anaesthetics uh, in the Southern Highlands in a little provincial hospital and uh, was told that we got to do the minor surgery there as the students. And this involved fractures, taking out eyes, uh, four foot amputations, draining abscesses. And I said, oh, that sounds good. Who does the anaesthetic? And they said, oh, you do that too. And you use this drug called ketamine. I went, oh, I'd never heard of ketamine. And uh, so we would go off and uh, do these procedures and give the anaesthetic and uh, unsupervised with no monitoring in unfasted patients. And I never killed anybody. And I was just amazed at how safe this drug was. So 20 years later, uh, you know, when I'm fully qualified as a specialist and had a, a couple of years experience under my belt, uh, the opportunity came up to go with a paediatric surgical team to PNG in 2001. And this has continued on till the current day. And uh, all of these have been under various um, auspices of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trading and uh, AusAid, um, all through the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons, trying to support paediatric anaesthesia and surgery in Papua New Guinea. So can we talk about all the organisations involved and, and how, how it's worked for you and how it works for Papua New Guinea and maybe how the ASA's role in all of that? Yes, it, it's, it's been a, a, a slow involvement over many years. Um, within Australia, we've got the Australian Society of Anaesthetists and the Australian New Zealand College of Anaesthetists. And the ASA traditionally have looked after the Pacific Islands and have a very long, well-established uh, support role uh, through Fiji, uh, Micronesia, uh, more lately through Timor, and they have a very big and active uh, overseas development and education committee that supports all these areas. And being in the Pacific, Australia and New Zealand sort of looked after our region in terms of training and supporting anaesthesia. PNG fell in a bit of a hole. It's a, it's a tough country to do business in. And there was nobody really looking after that and the anaesthetists there. PNG is a challenging place. It's the second biggest country in the area and has a population of 8 million people, half of which are under 15 years of age. Uh, it's rapidly growing. The population is predicted to double in the next 20 years. So we think of New Zealand as our nearest neighbour. Uh, our uh, border uh, in the Torres Strait goes within 50 kilometres of the PNG coastline. So it is truly our nearest neighbour. And it was a, before their independence in 1975, a territory of Australia. And there have been many connections for, through both world wars uh, and business and so forth between Australia and PNG. So there became a huge need for support for anaesthesia uh, in that country. And it is a, it is a challenging place to, do, uh, to work in because of um, corruption, uh, lack of governance, um, uh, security, uh, personal safety has to be taken into consideration. But the demand and need is enormous. PNG has some of the worst health statistics in the region, uh, it and Timor-Leste. And uh, some of these are akin to what we see in sub-Saharan Africa. So when you look at various maps about numbers of doctors, mortality rates and things like that, there is an often a, a sort of band that goes across sub-Saharan Africa, but it extends across into the Pacific, especially through parts of Indonesia, Timor and Papua New Guinea. So we realised early on that there was a great need and the PNG, the few PNG anaesthetists were very keen on uh, having support and we thought the ASA is doing well uh, looking after the rest of the Pacific and we will get the college involved and the college has been fantastic. And uh, in about 2005, 2006, 
Uh, we had a few teaching visits owing there set up by the college. At the time, Gary Phillips was the uh, visiting professor of anaesthesia in PNG and the professor at Flinders in South Australia. Gary had a, a great love of PNG. As a young man before he, he uh, did medicine, he was a KIAP or a patrol officer in PNG. So he, he really loved the country. And uh, he slowly got together a working party of a few key interested people. The college supported some visits. And then we finally, when Kate Leslie was the president, uh, developed the Overseas Aid Committee, uh, which I now chair. And that started about 2012. And since that time, uh, the main focus for that committee has been supporting anaesthesia in Papua New Guinea. And that's to meetings, uh, clinical visits, teaching, education, uh, wherever we can help. So what does the health system look like in Papua New Guinea? Uh, PNG, the health system runs on about one hundredth of what we have. Uh, we've been to hospitals where they've run out of oxygen and patients have died because there's no oxygen. Um, the drugs, uh, drug availability is poor, uh, it's out of date. Uh, they're cheap drugs that are often ineffective. Uh, the number of doctors that they have, they put out, UPNG put out about 50 doctors a year. And on some of the, the uh, WFSA and WHO models for numbers of specialists that you need, nearly all of those could join just anaesthesia each year and they wouldn't have enough anaesthetists. And uh, you realise then that's not taking into account obstetricians, surgeons, paediatricians, all the other specialties as well. So it's a, it's a big issue in terms of the number of people. Anesthesia's been fortunate in that we've slowly attracted a few good people every year who are slowly coming through their training system. And they have a four year training system in the Masters of Medicine in uh, anesthesia in PNG. And uh, slowly the young ones are coming through and starting to, to make their mark. We touched on safety before. What do you think the issues are in providing safe anaesthesia in Papua New Guinea, places like that? Yeah, well, I think, I think safe anaesthesia anywhere is a, is a big challenge, and especially in countries with low resources. And all our work and so forth in, in PNG all has happened at a, at a time when there's been this whole global movement of improving safe anaesthesia. And we know from our figures here in Australia and New Zealand that, that we have some of the safest figures for anaesthesia in the world. But that is not the same. And people often think, oh, you know, you go somewhere else, you, you'll be getting the same standard of care. And it's definitely not the case. And when you look at these things and break it all down, it means that you're more likely to die in these low resource countries from lack of access to a, a hospital that can do a laparotomy, a caesarean or fix your compound fracture um, than you are from AIDS, TB and malaria combined. Mm. And these are all communicable diseases that, that get a lot of publicity and a lot of funding. In PNG, 80% uh, of the population live in a village setting and they are really remote. They can be on some of the remote islands out in Milne Bay and it will take 10 hours, 12 hours longer to come by boat uh, into a little hospital that's got two operating theatres. And I've heard stories about women in obstructed labour lying in the bottom of a boat in Milne Bay, uh, come bouncing around in a storm, being pushed off reefs uh, in a, a sea ambulance to get to a hospital where they can have a seizure. And again, they may not survive, the baby may not survive. Uh, in the highlands, uh, some of the remote areas in the highlands could be several days walk. There may be no road. Uh, they don't have enough money to, to get any air evacuation. There's no retrieval service. Uh, recently, when we were working in, in Port Moresby, uh, we had a, a baby, a newborn baby, uh, come in. And this baby had a, a bowel obstruction, being born with a bowel obstruction, uh, for eight days. And the parents had to walk with this baby to a nearby river in Western Province. Then they had to get to a boat down or a, a banana boat two days down the river. And then they were finally able to get a mission plane into Port Moresby. And this baby was nearly dead. 
uh, and fortunately were able to get the baby through the procedure. It was certainly a very challenging anaesthetic and operation. And with a lot of paediatric surgery, if you can do the right operation on these kids early on, then they'll grow and thrive. And if they need more definitive surgery later on, then you can time that when there's local expertise or visiting teams or whatever. So what difference do you think it makes having teams like yours go into countries like this? What sort of change can you affect? That's right. Well, it, it, there's the pros and cons of, of short-term missions. I mean, we've been going, uh, the same surgeon and I, for 19 years now. I think the benefit occurs at several levels. One, you don't just go once. Uh, you need to go on a repeated basis uh, so that you know the local doctors, they know you, and there's mutual trust. And a lot of the PNG doctors we've been working with for years, uh, we're friends, we know their families, we know their kids, and, and it's, it's like a get together every year. You're only there for a couple of weeks, so you don't solve all the problems and you're not there just to do what you can do then. It's very much about transferring ability and expertise and capability. And so when we go, uh, I don't do the anaesthetic. I let the local registrar do as much as possible. If there's problems, I will help them. Uh, the surgeon gets the local surgeons who are training in paediatric anaesthesia to do the surgery. And it will take 50% longer than it would if he did it. But that's not what it's about. It's about training the local doctors to do it. And they are fantastic doctors, make no mistake. Even though they're working in an under-resourced setting, they're overwhelmed with the amount of work that they have. They love a challenge and they really want to do as best they can for their patients. What equipment do you take with you? You rely on the equipment that they have there and some of the monitors. We do take uh, some monitors with us, uh, usually so for bigger operations, and we've done some big cases. Uh, I do take a small supply of drugs uh, that are reliable that I know, uh, and we budget in for that. Um, a lot of disposable equipment like, like drips and endotracheal tubes, there's not a lot of those around for small children, uh, especially kids under 10 kilos. So we try and take all of that as well. But we're only there for two weeks of the year. The other mm. 50 weeks, they have to cope. So we usually over cater. We leave as much as possible uh, so that they've, they've got it when they, the next patient comes in. And uh, at least with the internet now and uh, uh, various apps for communication, uh, we, can, we can communicate with them. And if there's questions, uh, I got an email the other day about one of the patients we operated on up there who had bad congenital heart disease, needed bowel surgery, he did well, and because the local anaesthetists were really worried about anaesthetising this child. And uh, they emailed me again and said, look, we've got to operate on him again in, up in the Highlands. Uh, what do you advise? And you know what they've got. You can send an email and you know, give them the rundown advice, know what they've got available, and then let them know. And, and that went well. Good. <laughs> So what about the WFSA? What's their role in all of this? The WFSA has been running since the 50s. It's a unique organisation. It's very lean and it does amazing things. But there is a big focus on trying to improve standards and safety. The WFSA has a huge amount of initiatives uh, that they are rolling out and uh, continuing to roll out. Uh, one of the, the most successful has been the Lifebox Oximeter. And like a lot of these things, they're multi-partnered. It's been done, Lifebox has been done with Harvard and the Association of Anaesthetists of Great Britain and Ireland. And this is a low cost, robust pulse oximeter uh, that can be donated. Uh, it'll work on a neonate, it'll work on an adult, and you can drop it, it'll keep working, it'll run on ordinary batteries, power, whatever. And this is one of the, the basic tenets of safety of anaesthesia, is that you can monitor a patient's oxygen. And they've rolled out 20,000 of these to operating theatres and recoveries around the world, in only in low resource settings, not in affluent countries. And their other uh, initiatives, they've got uh, surgical site uh, infection uh, program, uh, operating lights for surgeons, and the WFSA is being involved in a whole lot of other educational initiatives. On the subject of teaching, you have taught on the GASCAT courses about this sort of overseas 
work, what do you teach our trainees about it? There's a, a lot of involvement for the trainees and uh, uh, it's certainly very uh, heartwarming and encouraging to have the young ones come up and say, look, this is, this is fantastic, um, you know, I'd like to be involved. And some do and some don't. And uh, we try and promote this at various meetings by running workshops that if you go on a short term mission or you go on a teaching visit of things to take into consideration. And there's a lot to take into consideration. You need to think about uh, your own safety, your own health, how you teach, how you interact appropriately in a culturally sensitive way in that country and, and that you transfer skills and abilities that enable those people to, to work and contribute to their society in a better manner. The Real World Anesthesia course is one of the great successes that, that was originally started in Hobart by Hayden Pernt yep. and uh, now has evolved between uh, uh, Darwin and Geelong and Christchurch uh, with three different centres rotating it and it is it sells out within hours mm. every year and it's a hands-on uh, one week course about all the aspects of working in a really challenging situation where you don't have reliable power, you may not have reliable oxygen, uh, suction may not be available, poor drugs, um, you know, how do you cope with all the challenges in this area? And uh, it, it really challenges people uh, who are outside their comfort zones of working in big and well-equipped hospitals like we all work in every day. Do you see any mental health issues with people coming back from these sort of assignments? You can, you can. It, it is a different stress to what we normally have on a daily basis. I know personally uh, when I've come back from, from some of the visits, especially, you know, sometimes we will take on emergency cases that are going to die and the patient will die and you come home a bit depressed and a bit devastated mm. by all of that and you think, why do I do that? Um, hopefully in the treatment of the patient, even though it wasn't successful, you've transferred some knowledge to the local doctors that they will be able to use next time and it might be successful, but it still takes a, a personal toll. Mm. You're, you're often physically exhausted. Days tend to be a bit long and, and slow and lugging gear on and off trucks and planes and things like that. Um, but it's also very different. There's no bureaucracy. Uh, there's no minimal paperwork. Uh, you don't have administrators annoying you. The patients are great and they say thank you. Uh, but it does, it does take its toll sometimes. And I think you need to have a little bit of personal resilience and resourcefulness in that everything you want and have here may not be available there and, and probably won't be available. Usually there'll be one of anything and if that breaks, there won't be a replacement. Michael, thanks so much for coming today. It was a really wonderful discussion. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. It was, it was an honour and a privilege to be here. And I, I think it reflects greatly on the anaesthetists and the fellows of the college in Australia and New Zealand of all the many contributions they make outside their, their normal uh, daily work. <laughs>